Good morning. My name is Walter Kernan. I'm a professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine, and I'm here at the American Heart Association meeting in San Diego. My guest this morning is Dr. Richard Bernstein, who is a professor of medicine and head of the stroke service at Northwestern University. Dr. Bernstein is here at the meeting to present the results of the Crystal AF study. Dr. Bernstein, tell us a little bit about this work. Thank you. Uh, the Crystal AF study was designed to see whether or not implanting an uh, automatic atrial fibrillation detection device under the skin that can stay in for up to three years was better than standard monitoring to detect AFib in patients with stroke of unknown cause. And what we found in this study was that the implanted device was far superior to standard monitoring for detecting AFib in what I consider to be a very rigorously defined population of cryptogenic stroke patients. Tell us a little bit more about your methods. Who were the patients you enrolled? How did you select them? And what exactly did you find? These were patients who had a non-lacunar stroke on brain imaging for whom we could not identify a clear cause. So we screened them with vascular imaging and found no proximal source for the stroke. We looked at every single patient with a transesophageal echo, didn't find a high-risk source of embolism. Every patient had at least 24 hours of continuous ECG monitoring, no atrial fibrillation, no obvious other causes like hypercoagulable states, valve disease, or cancer. And what we did was half of them were randomly assigned to standard monitoring, which means whatever the investigators at the local sites thought was the standard of care to work up symptoms or further evaluate the patient, versus implantation of the Reveal XT, which is a subcutaneous monitor that automatically detects atrial fibrillation. And what we found is that at six months, at 12 months, and even out to three years, the implanted device was far superior at detecting clinically unsuspected atrial fibrillation compared to standard monitoring. Very interesting. So this is a group of people for whom you can be very confident that they uh, do not have a clear alternative explanation for their stroke. Yes. How do your findings uh, for atrial fibrillation compare to the findings in other publications? In other words, lots of investigators have looked for occult atrial fibrillations in patients with an uh, idiopathic ischemic stroke. How do your results compare to those other results? Well, I think um, our results are, is, are, are the largest randomized trial to compare our method of monitoring to a standard. Um, most of what's come before has been convenient samples or retrospective analyses. Not that they're not valuable, they're very valuable, but I think ours was a more rigorous design. And the other thing to realize is that cryptogenic stroke means two things. It, it means inadequately evaluated patients, meaning they had some subset of the tests that we think are necessary, but not all of them. And it can also mean patients who have had a very thorough evaluation, in particular transesophageal echocardiography, and no source was found. And we really didn't want to be... Um, accused of not having thoroughly evaluated our patients prior to enrolling them. So we insisted that every single patient have a transesophageal echo. And I think what that did was weed out a lot of what you might call the low-hanging fruit, so that patients on transesophageal echo who had spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrial appendage or valvular sources of stroke, things that might be markers for atrial fibrillation were weeded out by the TEE and that may explain why our yield was a little bit lower than the yield in some of the less highly selected populations uh, done with external monitors. Tell us a little bit about this device. This is, a, as I understand it, it's a device that has to be implanted by yes. a cardiologist, presumably. Yes. What are the alternatives, mm -hmm. and why did you choose this device among all other potential strategies for looking for occult atrial fibrillation? Well, other than an implanted therapeutic device like a pacemaker or defibrillator, this device is really the only way of monitoring people for not just weeks, but months or even years at a time. It's exactly the size of a thumb drive. It's implanted in a outpatient procedure that takes about 15 minutes with local anesthetic, usually by a cardiologist or electrophysiologist. And it's got an automatic atrial fibrillation detection algorithm 
that stores episodes of AFib so that we get not only a yes-no about whether or not the patient has AFib, but we get information about the burden of AFib, how often they're having it, what the ventricular rate is. So it really gives us very comprehensive information about the, the arrhythmia. Uh, can you comment uh, for a moment about the therapeutic implications of this finding? And in particular, uh, I want to ask you, do you feel these uh, patients who are detect determined to have occult AFib should be treated with an anticoagulant? Or do you feel we need clinical trials to tell us what to do with these patients? That's a good question, and I think it's only with implanted devices like this that we can scientifically study what amount of AFib becomes clinically necessary uh, uh, to anticoagulate. But what we found is that the investigators voted with their feet because 97% of the patients in both arms who were found to have AFib were put on anticoagulation, even though that was not sp specified by the study protocol. The other thing we found is that 90 plus percent of the patients who had AFib detected on the implanted monitor had at least one day with more than six minutes of AFib. So we were, by and large, not dealing with isolated 30-second episodes of AFib, but we were dealing with patients who had minutes to hours at a time of atrial fibrillation. And I think as that time uh, of AFib increases, there's less and less doubt about the need to anticoagulate. So let me press you. Uh, what do you think is a clinically significant amount of AFib in this population? And can your study address that? For instance, do you have outcome information? All of our patients in the study had an embolic appearing stroke, so I don't think our study will answer the question of, in a person with risk factors but no stroke, what's the, the de minimis amount of AFib below which anticoagulation is not needed. Uh, that would require a, a screening study in people with risk factors but no known stroke. But what we will learn is um, what are some of the predictors of going on to have a stroke in patients who are continuously monitored if they have a history of stroke, and those analyses are forthcoming, I don't want to guess at what they'll show because I don't know the answer yet. What's the next step? Well, I think the next step is to look more deeply at who the patients were that, that had AFib on the monitor. What are some of the echocardiographic predictors? What are some of the MRI predictors? What are some of the clinical predictors? We heard some already today at the meeting about similar analyses of retrospective studies, and it'll be interesting to see if we can pick out a clinical signature that makes patients especially high risk uh, to have AFib on an implantable device. One last question for you. For hospitals, investigators, patients who don't have access to this device, this implantable device, does the result of your research suggest that alternative monitoring might be just as effective? It really doesn't. In fact, to find a handful of patients with atrial fibrillation at one year, and by a handful I mean three or four patients out of 220, um, required about 150 other tests, spontaneous uh, spot ECGs, Holter monitors, event monitors, whereas this one test found at three years almost 10 times more AFib. So we're going to do that formal analysis, but my impression from looking at the data is in this patient population, not much else is very useful other than continuous monitoring over months at a time. I just said it was my last question. I want to take it back. You could be an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> this device is implanted under the skin, presumably with anesthesia. Uh, what are the complications? What are the adverse effects that participants need to be concerned about? And specifically, can you have an MRI if you have this thing in your chest? Uh, let me answer the second question first. The, the device is defined to be what's called MR conditional, uh, which practically means you can have an MRI, but the MRI does exert a tiny tug on the device that's not clinically meaningful. So patients can have MRIs of the brain and did in the study. The, the second question is an important one. We found that there was about a 2.5% complication rate of putting in the device. The complications were infection or erosion of the pocket where the device is implanted. There were no long-term sequelae, but in those 2.5%, the device had to be explanted. Cost? Is this an expensive device? It is an expensive device, and we'll be doing a cost-benefit uh, analysis looking at the presumed stroke prevention versus the cost of the device as a further analysis uh, of our study. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you about this study. Thank you very much.